Warning, the following podcast contains violent scenes that may be unsettling to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. In 1987, four childhood friends were reunited after 10 years to investigate the murder of a mentor they all shared. During this time, they unlocked the deep secrets of the past and found themselves exposed to the darkness that surrounded them. Soon it became more than a fight for justice. And instead, it became a fight against the ultimate evil. Six months later, in the winter of 1988, bonded by their knowledge of the dark unknown, they have decided to no longer be the victim. Now they seek out the deep roots of satanic corruption that hides in the shadows of society, all the while trying to mentor a new companion, seeking justice for the death of his cousin. Institutionalized is the second story arc in the Chronicles of Darkness first edition story, The Ultimate Evil, set in Bismarck, North Dakota in 1988. Join us in this tale of satanic horror with Wayne, played by Adam, Che, played by Andrew, Alex, played by Mitch, Michael, played by Slavic, and the newcomer Derek, played by Tillman. If you'd like to contact us, you can find us on Twitter at twin underscore cities underscore VTM, and on Facebook and Discord at Twin Cities by Night. If you'd like to help support the podcast, you can find us on Patreon at Twin Cities by Night. We hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Ultimate Evil Institutionalized. So, Alex, since the events that occurred six months ago, and after getting your licensing to have a private investigator license working with your friends, and Bismarck, and actually finding out that the results had already been done for you on the test when you were handed your packet. What has Alex been doing in the last three months since the business has opened, Dakota Investigative Services, since you all started working smaller cases on like adultery or bankruptcy cases? What, what has been going on in Alex's life? Alex has largely been trying to work through some of his personal issues. He's turned a little inward. He's become very, very angry at what happened to him and his friends. So his vice of lust has become more of a lust for revenge or to punish people that would do that sort of thing to others. Uh, He's been pushing away his addiction as much as possible, doing a little more running, working on his art in particular, Got himself a couple dots of crafts now. He's also been studying the occult more and more, trying to figure out what's going on with him and all of the cult shit that they encountered. He's still keeping his job. He's just a lot less aimless. You know, he's a little more focused, definitely avoids many of his old vices, still smokes, still drinks, just much more moderately. He's actually cutting back and planning on quitting smoking so that he could run even better. So you mentioned, and we saw that earlier, where Alex was upset at the whole situation. He was upset, especially when the offer was given for you all to be backed to to start this Dakota Investigative Services company. And you mentioned that anger consumes him and has led him to become somewhat more moderate in his vices, hasn't gone back to drugs, has given him a purpose to better his, his, become physically in better shape to try to find any kind of answers for what you all saw. But how has that anger affected his relationships? You say that you still work at the main bar. So you have that friendship with Carla that was budding there. And you were known while dealing, working at the main bar for being able to deal with customers and be personable and be able to kind of like use your charm. Is that still there? Or is, it, or is that anger bubbling past the service now and starting to affect the relationships that you have? No, he'll still definitely turn on the charm and do everything he can as a bartender to bring in the tips. Um, As far as Carla goes, you know, he's going to put up more of a wall there. He'll still be kind. He'll still, you know, slip hundreds into her purse whenever he can. But he's not going to be as friendly or as cheerful. He'll try to keep a safe distance between himself and any more close relationships outside of the guys. He's also going to be on the lookout for troublemakers among the customers. And he'll probably take a harsher stance towards cutting them off if they get too drunk, asking the bouncer to kick their asses out. Is, is that because he wants to feel like he's in control? 
Or is that because that's a way for him to release his anger is to kind of be tougher and to, to, to be more dominant over people like that? Both to sort of impose himself on the world around him instead of having the world impose itself on him. And a little bit because he doesn't want shit to start if he can stop it. So he's trying, I get it. So this is his domain in a, in a roundabout way, but also he feels like he's doing good by doing that, by preventing something bad from happening. Yes. Okay. Now, how does that passion that you have now and that control that you want to feel, how does that affect your day-to-day activities with this Dakota Investigative Services? What do you do with them when it comes to like the activities that they do? You know, like Che mentioned that he does more of like he likes to stake out people and kind of follow people and get information and everyone's kind of fit into their own little role. Like what is your outlook when it comes to that business and what everyone's doing so far with it? Well, one of the things um, is that Alex didn't get a PI license. He specifically avoided that just so that he could do the shady shit and not have to worry about getting in further trouble if he gets caught with his license and the penalties that might be associated with that. He's happy to use his old connections among the criminal element you know, drug dealers, other people that he knew to sort of help research any issues. Plus, he has some skills in that neck of the woods himself, you know, a little bit of larceny on his character sheet there. So sometimes he's not above, you know, maybe breaking into someone's house to collect evidence for the guys and he can just pretend, oh, I'm not associated. I'm just, you know, a thief. I'm an addict, blah, blah, blah. So your your relationship with them is definitely an informal one. I mean, you would still go there and hang out with them, I take it, but you're definitely not working for them on any kind of W-4 or anything to that extent, right? No, he's probably working for them on a cash basis and he'll definitely help with the cases. It'll just be sort of a cash basis off the books so that he can get away with stuff that they wouldn't necessarily be able to get away with. So now you mentioned before that you've been getting more into your drawing. We saw in Ultimate Evil Remembrance where Alex's way of dealing and compartmentalizing with things that he was being exposed to was to have an artistic release through it. Uh, A lot of times it was just scribbling with crayons or pencils or whatever he could find, but he found that losing himself and that process of drawing helped him not only deal with his drug addiction that he was trying to combat, but also with the, the, the reality that he was being faced with. Now, you said you've been doing more of that, so does that mean you've been taking it more on an artistic level, like more seriously instead of random drawings that it's more like you have like better tools to use and you're trying to focus on it more? Well, he's definitely getting better at the actual art part of it itself. He is using it very much so as sort of an art therapy. He's not like producing art for sale or anything like that. So his room, his parents' house, their basement, everything is just going to be covered in his art. He sort of, when he starts to draw, he just loses himself in this sort of meditative mindset where the images, the creativity that he wants, the message or the story he wants to tell just flows without him necessarily being consciously aware of it. He just does it. And then he might snap to an hour or two later, look at what he did. And was like, Oh, oh, holy shit. Yeah. That's definitely been happening with him. Or sometimes you'll fall asleep while working on like this desk that you have set up or sometimes fall asleep in your bed where you have like a pad that you're drawing on, you know, with your knees propped up, you'll snap out and you'll be confronted by what you have seen. So definitely. Now, how has his relationship been with his mother and his father now since he's kind of dealt with the ramifications of what happened six months ago? He treasures his parents that much more. First off, you know, he's probably a lot nicer to his mother, spends more time with her, helps his dad out more, a lot more involved with their properties and any other business, runs errands for them, that sort of thing. As much as he's able around his work schedule, you know, he chips in money around the house. He does everything he can to remind them that he's better and that he's no longer shooting up, you know, in the bathroom or anything like that. Definitely. Definitely. So let's cut to a scene. You're sitting on a couch and you feel lips going along your earlobe. In front of you, you see this living room, a small living room that looks like it's in an apartment. You see this TV that's sitting on a TV stand that has antennas, very old color TV. You see there looks like there are some toys that are along the floor that could have probably belonged to a toddler. You see wooden box, wooden squares and blocks that have the alphabet colored in reds and oranges and blues and yellows and greens. You see 
a little tripod of circular bright colored donuts that go along this yellow stick for that looks like toddlers who are figuring out that pegs go into holes. You see a teddy bear that looks like it's on its last leg that's been handed down through generations. And you see random hot rod cars that are along the floor. And you can feel the hot breath that's going in your ear, your left ear. And you feel a hand that's going up your chest. And you look down at your chest and you see that you have no shirt on, but you have some jeans on. Your belt buckle's unbuckled and your top button's undone. But you kind of see through the jeans and you can kind of feel the tightness around there that you're starting to get aroused from what is going on. And you hear this voice whisper in your ears and she's like, let me go down on you. And you hear her whisper that as she's rubbing her hand along your chest. And she's like, come on, you got to relax. Alex is going to look to see who's talking. You turn and you look and you see this face you don't recognize. She's blonde. Her hair is permed. And it kind of goes down to the middle of her neck, but it gives the body of her hair a round type of volume. And you see these yellow teeth that she's speaking from that look like they've been stained from coffee and cigarettes. And you can see that her skin's kind of blemished, but she has freckles and she has these gray eyes. And when you turn to face her and you hear her voice speaking to you, you can smell her breath and it smells like that she's had some drinks. And she's like, he's taking a nap. Come on, let's do it. And then she slides down on her knees and she gets in front of you and she's looking up at you. Why don't you ever do it with me, Alex? Why don't we ever do this? Huh? How many times have we been out? Alex was going to take a very careful look around the apartment and he's going to take a very long look at her face to try to sear the image into his brain. And then he's going to stand up. As you try to stand up, you feel the hand go on your chest like it's gently trying to push like, no, 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 don't go. She like pushes try to push you back a little bit and with the other hand she's trying to fumble with your fly no no this, yes. this, this is wrong this is where am i who are you just relax god damn it just relax and you see she like her hand kind of goes up to your chin to like push your face to look up at the ceiling and she's like just relax just relax and you feel like her fingertips are gently kind of going on your lips and then you start hearing this just relax big boy it's going to be all fine, you little son of a bitch. And you like, for a second, you start to look down with your eyes as she's pushing down. You see the hand and the hand has no skin on it. And you just feel this wetness on your face. And you look down and you see the skinless face looking up to you with these bright white eyeballs. Like you can see the white of the eyeballs that directly contrast against the sinew and the muscles and the fat that are on this face. And he's looking up at you. He's like, don't you realize, big boy? You're not going anywhere without me. We're together for the rest of our lives, you little son of a bitch. I told you we'd be together for the rest of our lives. And you snap awake and you look down at this drawing that you were just drawing. And you're looking at this desk and you see the pencils are spread apart and you scream for a second. You just hear it come out of your mouth. What's going on in your head right now? Oh, well, I'm sure that he's going to take a minute to catch his breath and sort of wipe some of the sweat off his brow and then he's going to take a long look at the picture that he was drawing and try to figure out what the fuck just happened he's not happy about having nightmares again when you look down at this drawing you see that you did it on a piece of paper that's probably like three foot by three foot like like the larger types of paper that people usually do larger sketches on and you see it resembles da vinci's vitruvian do you know what the vitruvian is da vinci's Vit- vitruvian i don't know if i'm pronouncing it correctly yeah it's the drawing of man like at different angles. And you see that in the middle of it, where the man was and Da Vinci's original piece of art, you see there's a skinless man. You can see like the tendons and the muscle layers go along the body. And you can see like the, still see the flaccid penis, but you can see the face. And this time though, when you look at the face, the details of it, you see the sick grin that's on there. And you see that those eyes, those Welkstetter eyes that you saw And whatever that was in the middle middle of the wilderness, that thing you wrote about in your journal. And there's a moment you're staring at those eyes because those eyes, unlike the rest of the body, are distinctly human still. They're still the eyes that, similar to the eyes that you see when you talk to individuals every day at work or when you talk to your friends or when you look in the mirror, when you brush your teeth or when you see your parents. You still see those human eyes that are trapped in this demonic figure. And then on above that, to the north of this drawing, you see a black silhouette. It's like behind 
the shoulders and the head of this dried up into the top part. And the black silhouette is the silhouette of a woman. But you cannot make anything out. It's pure black. And you can see the silhouette of black hair coming out from behind it. And behind her head at the very top of this drawing is a red circular moon that is pure red. Almost like she has overbearing on this figure that's in the middle. On the left, you see a silhouette. It's almost like a drawing on the left. It looks like a figure that is throwing with one hand forms that look to be pregnant women into what could probably be a well. And in their left hand, they have a knife. And you see that you saw that when you draw it and the one figure's falling in, it looks like there's other pregnant females that have fallen in that well. Like they're piling up. Like you can see into the well and see where they're piling up. On the right of this drawing, you see a figure in snow from like the shoulders up. It's a beautiful woman. Her face is resting in snow. Her eyes have a dead glazed over look. And she has blood trickling down her mouth. And there's a fly that's resting on some of that blood. And then on the bottom of this drawing, opposite from the woman in front of the red moon, there's a city skyline. You see lights that light up the night of it and buildings and skyscrapers that go along it. And that's what you see with your drawing. What is going on in Alex's mind after he sees that? He's a little disoriented at first. Um, He doesn't really remember where all this is coming from. So he's going to take a few minutes to really take in the details. And then he's going to try to get the haze out of his head and see if he can sort of make some sort of sense of the images, like put them in order or dissect them to figure out where they came from and where they're going. Yes, uh, go ahead and give me a... Let's do an intelligence and academics. And I will give you... No, I'm just going to have you do intelligence and academics, please. Tell me how many successes you got. How many did you get? Zero successes. Zero successes. Zero. So you're staring at this drawing and you're just trying to make sense of it. And it does, there's, you're trying to grasp onto anything other than Welk Setter that's in the middle. And you're desperately looking. You're looking to the top. You're looking to the left, to the figures getting thrown in the well. You're looking to the right, to the dead face in the snow with the fly on it. You're looking to the figure, the silhouette onyx figure. That's above on this red moon. And you're looking at that city skyline and you're just, there's like almost like a sense of panic because you have no idea what any of that is. You lost yourself. You're trying to remember when you even started drawing this. You don't even remember drawing this. And there's this moment where like your breathing starts going and you feel your heart rate going up as you're staring at this because you, this is something completely alien that came from you and you have no recognition of what you did, what led to this. And then your door opens up and you hear Alex, Alexa, Alexa. And you're like, she... You see your mom standing there. She's in her bathrobe. She has a nightgown underneath. And you can see she's rubbing sleep out of her eyes. And she's looking at you. And you're at your desk. You fell asleep at your drawing desk. And you're like in a pair of shorts right now. And you're drenched in sweat. She walks up to you. And she like puts your face between her hands. And she like turns you to look at her. She sees the panic in your eyes. What's wrong? What's wrong? Alex will respond to her in Russian. Uh, Nothing, nothing. I just had a bad dream. I was taking a nap. You see, there's a moment where she's like, Alex, Alex, it's, it's, it's three in the morning. And she like, then you see her glance down at the picture and she like looks at the picture for a second with a concerned look. And then she looks up at you. Don't, don't worry about it. I was just, you know, I fell asleep while I was working on some new art. I'm okay. I just had a bad dream. That's all. You see, there's a moment where like, she's in a situation that pains her because She feels she needs to size up everything you say to her. And she doesn't like that. She has to do that. You know, she's been lied to before by you. And she's been taken advantage. But she loves you. You know her love is unconditional. But you know when she sees you in moments like this of pain, of concern, her first reactions always is to weigh what you have told her to whether or not you were using again. And you can see she balances that out in her head. And there's about a moment of 30 seconds or so to where finally you can tell by the station of her eyes and the way her facial muscles relax, that she's accepted what you have said. She looks at you and she's like, it is almost four in the morning. I, it's not quite three. Do you want me to make you breakfast? Do you, you want tea? And we make some tea and we talk. No, mom, it's okay. Go back to bed. And she's mom, like, I got it from here. Oh, and she's like, you see a moment where she looks at you and she looks at the drawing again. And then she just like gently like pats your face on the side. And then she like turns around and she tightens her bathrobe and walks back out of the room. And you're left there 
on your own. Now, you know that it is early Monday morning and that usually Monday mornings, you guys will meet at the Dakota Investigative Services on Main Street. What are you going to do until then? Alex is going to try to go back to sleep. You crawl back into your bed and you find yourself able to sleep and you sleep peacefully. But right before you hit the REM, you are worried that you will always hear that voice in your dreams. All right, we'll cut to Derek next. Derek, you open the door to the shop and you're greeted with the sunlight reflecting off the metal of these bumpers. You can feel the cold crispness of the air. You can see snow drifts that are on the side of this parking lot. And you still feel almost out of breath in a way because of just having gotten laid off. You still feel the vapors of the Jack Daniels that you took a shot of that your boss gave you. And you have this envelope that's in your hand that has the check in it. What's going on in your head right now? I think uh, Derek can't really fathom what just happened. and He's not really sure how to proceed right now. He's going to look into the envelope just to just to find out. Like, he's curious and... It's not like he doesn't trust his now former boss, but he like needs to see it to believe it in a way. And you see a month's worth of pay that is in there. And you see like the pay stub that comes along with it. You hear a crinkle from that crinkle plastic that is usually in the, those envelopes. And you, as you open it up and you look and you see that warm, visually appealing look of a check. You can feel it under your hands. You know how the paper is a little thicker. You can tell that this is something that is going to bring food to your family but rather than just a letter that you would get from a distant relative or some junk mail that you would get in your apartment mailbox. That feeling of a check when you take it out of an envelope like that on payday is a feeling that is brings joy and a little dopamine. But at this moment, when you look at it, you're confused because you know this is the last check that you're getting from there, but you know at least you have a month's worth of pay that you can pay rent, help with medical bills, help with food for your parents. And as you're looking at that check and you see that it's real, you hear this, and it sounds like an engine that's trying to turn over from the parking lot. Yeah, I look around myself just to, just to be safe in a way, <laughs> like I'm not standing in the way. Yeah, and you see that there's a, there's a car. It looks like an older car, maybe like 10 years old. It looks like an Oldsmobile, like one of those longer cars that are made of thick Detroit metal and you see the figure of Greg, the one who got laid off before you. And you can see him like he's trying to turn the car to start it. You can see him through the windshield. You can see like with his right hand, he's sitting there trying to go. (laughs) Then you see a moment of silence. He's like hitting his fists on the fucking steering wheel. Yeah. Walk over to him and like knock on his uh, window. And you see him look up at you and then he just kind of like opens the door and like you kind of step back just to give him a, you know what I mean? A couple feet to open the door and he gets out. He's, you can see his eyes are red. Like he's probably was crying in there, but he's trying not to cry in front of another man. And he's about a half a foot shorter than you. He's, he's rather lanky compared to you. And he has like this wispy, like blonde goatee. And he has like kind of, you know, thick blonde hair. That's kind of like combed back a little bit, but it's shorter end. And he has this thick winter jacket on, but doesn't have any gloves. And he, looks at he's like the fucking starter goddamn fucking starter don't you know it's fucking out again that's all i fucking need he's like man i hate to ask you this because i assume you're on the same goddamn boat as me but can you give me a ride back to my trailer i gotta have my father-in-law fucking pick this up for me yeah sure we can do that was gonna suggest the same honestly thanks man you're a good guy and he like kind of like looks around and he sees your van that you drove and he kind of like walks up to it you know walks over to it with you as he waits for you like to unlock it and everything, you know, like a probably a ten year old van or something like that. So yeah, so I try to uh, start it up. So you start it up, and he's sitting in the pastor seat as you know the warmth kind of kicks on right away, and you kind of give it like a minute or two to warm up before you start driving it. And the guy's just like looking out the window. He's like, "Ain't that some shit? Ain't this some fucking shit? I swear to fucking god, damn it! I can't keep a fucking job. I didn't do anything this time. I showed up every fucking time. I fucking work." I don't know what the fuck to do. The boss told me his ass is on the line as well. It's this fucking shit. All these fucking jobs are all these fucking jobs are leaving. You know, you hear about it on the news all the fucking time. And how how are we? And he looks at you and he kind of like makes a hand motion back between you and him. He's like, how 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 are people like us supposed to support our families? Like, what the fuck are we supposed to do? All 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 the my father fucking worked for goddamn AT and T and got a fucking retirement working thirty fucking years. And I can't even keep a job for longer than a year and a half. 
and, and then and then and then I got my fucking father in law sitting there trying to make me look like I'm a fucking piece of shit. I graduated, I got a fucking diploma, and I got a fucking job. That's what my fucking dad did in the work. And 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 now I'm I'm being accused of being a dirtbag. I can't even take care of my wife and kids because I was on fucking food stamps for a fucking six months. God fucking forbid. Right? God fucking forbid. All those people on the res, they get their shit all the fucking time, but God fucking forbid for six months I get fucking food stamps and all of a sudden I'm a fucking piece of shit. Yeah, Derek is just gonna let him rant a bit, occasionally ask for directions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and as he's like, you know, ranting, he's kind of pointing, like, turn here. And you're, you're right now kind of like on the west side of town and he lives further on, like on the southeast of town, kind of past the airport a little bit. And he's like, uh, as he's ranting, he stops for a second. And he's like, I know you don't want to hear my shit. Do you got, do you got anything that backed up that you can fall back on? At least I'm all fucking sitting here thinking about myself and shit. And I'm not even thinking about whatever you got on your plate. Uh, I don't know. I have this side gig, but honestly, it's more like a hobby. I've been doing furniture repairs for some people in town, but really just, you know, that's money on the side. Honestly, I was hoping that maybe I could save up a little bit and, Uh, I don't know. That's all gone now. So you got nothing. You got no job opportunities lined up, huh? Well, I don't know. I, just like you, I I learned this welding stuff. And now the, the biggest welding shop in, in town is gone. It doesn't look like there's any any market for a new one here. Go ahead and give me intelligence and composure, please. And I'll give you a plus one dice to it, please. Let me know how many successes you get. I have three successes. Oh, wow. I love the Chronicles of Darkness system, by the way. So much. I, I really do. You're sitting there as he's saying that, like, you know, like, do you have anything planned up? And you were just talking about your welding and your wood shop type stuff you've been doing The in your head. And it pops in the Meredith Welkstetter's name. And you start thinking about how six months ago you had where Jerry had talked to you and had you introduce those weird group of guys who somehow were tied to your sister. And it kind of just like clicks in your head. As you're looking out the windshield, as you're driving, as you hear like the, you kind of lose yourself in the thought of it as you hear like the snow and the dirt and the gravel hit your wheel well of your van as you're making these turns, as you feel the heat hitting your face, as your van's finally starting to warm up, as you feel like the suspension that barely has any power steering is turning and it clicks in your head. You're like, oh shit, I forgot about that where they offered me that a while ago. Cause you kind of push that out of your head because You wanted to focus on your job. You wanted to focus on your family. You were driven at that point. You hear from the pastor side from Greg. He's like, you okay there, buddy? You lost some thought? Do you need to get a drink or something? No, no, it's good. I already had one. And honestly, it's a bit early. I was just thinking of my father, you know. Would you say you have told Greg about your father? I probably mentioned it before. Like if he was paying attention, he would remember and uh, Derek is holding that thought he doesn't want to feel stupid in front of his co-worker and say like oh I have this detective gig like he's still not sure whether that's really an option what about your father is he doing oh, okay you know, no he's not doing okay he can barely walk that's mostly related to him having overworked himself in construction things but now he you know he he's just sitting around smoking and drinking mm. But it's hard, man. It's a trap. It's trapped, don't you know? You know, like you feel helpless. I felt that way. I felt that way sitting on my ass for six months and not finding work. Shit, I can only imagine being broke, broken, you know, like not being able to go get a job and have to be stuck in that reality. Yeah, he hates it. He, he doesn't talk about it, but any man would hate any man would hate that. Here, here's I know what I'm going to do. I think I finally figured out I'm going to join the Marines. I'm going to go talk to that recruiter. I'm going to go. I'm going to join. I'm going to, I can't fucking do this shit anymore. Cause I know that there's something that I can go do that is at least right. And, and does something, don't you know, to, to help out people. And if that's joining the military, then I'm going to fucking do that instead of sitting here feeling sorry for myself. I just sitting here, just fucking decided that shit. I thought about it after high school and I didn't want to go do it. And now here four years later, what other options do I got? Greg, how old are you right now? I'm about 22. And your kids? Uh, I got a two-year-old and a three-year-old. Mm -hmm. Like, what? I what are my other choices? You know, I there's an option there. It's doing that. I almost did join the Marines when I graduated high school, but I didn't want to. I wanted to go fucking party and I wanted to whatever. And it's always been there. That option's been right there in front of my fucking face. I could have done that shit six months ago with my fucking father-in-law getting on my ass. And what did I do instead? I fucking sat on my ass and didn't do shit. 
and let the world pass me by for six months until I came out of it. I was just like your fucking dad, almost. I mean, I'm not trying to compare what your father's going through to what my, what I went through there, you know, but don't you know, it's, it's very similar. We easily can fall into these traps of complacency. I had, this, is my, this is my trailer coming up over here, a couple blocks down right there. Right. Hey, man. And you see as he like turns around before he gets out and he looks at you and he's like, if you ever need to get a drink, let me know. You're going to be okay today? I didn't know where I'm going after this. I'm going to fucking take a cab and go talk to that recruiter, get my family in the right situation. I tried to live this Bismarck life and I can't do it. Or it can't do me. I don't fucking know. I hope you, fall, I hope you land on your feet, kid. Yeah, I'll probably find something, but <laughs> it would be cool if I don't have to look again in another six months. <sighs> yeah. Sounds like nothing's guaranteed anymore. He gets out and he opens the door and he, you feel the cold rush of the wind come through. And he's like, you see the wind kind of blow his hair a little bit. He looks up at you. He's like, seriously, you want to get a beer? You know where I live. He like closes the door and you see him turn and he walks down like this unleveled sidewalk to this like white trailer. It looked like it was white at one time, but you see it kind of has like the elements have taken its hold. As he like walks up the door and stomps on his feet, you see him take a deep breath and then he opens his door and he goes into it as you're left there on your own. What's going on in your head right now, Derek? So this is a, a trailer park. Yes, it is. Yeah, I think Derek is kind of feeling like shit because he doesn't know this kind of struggle. Like he, uh, his father has it pretty bad, but his family uh, gets by. Like they have two apartments between the three of them, multiple cars. He has this uh, side business that he did mostly for fun, as he mentioned. That's really surprising to be honest with me as a storyteller that Derek feels bad about that like I almost think that's selfless in a way not selfish but selfless you know like you're you just got laid off you have a sick father you're helping provide you don't really have anything lined up and you're you see this man getting you know he's stepping into some shit with his father you know what I mean probably gonna hear it from his wife or his father-in-law he's gonna have to go join the service who knows if his marriage will even last him going through boot camp or any shit like that and you're still you feel empathy for him over yourself is that normal for Derek uh, I think so um, him being like mostly introverted he he probably uh, always considers like am I behaving adequately in this situation if that makes sense so let me ask you this with that thought of you whether or not you're feeling adequately ad- adequately and then you with the realization, remembering the offer for Meredith, how does that make you feel knowing that there's this group of strangers, well, people you're not familiar with who are looking into an important matter that affected your life and you're not involved in it? Now, this isn't me as a storyteller trying to push you. I'm not trying to do that. But I mean, just, you know, you're talking about the adequacy and the issues going on and that just coming in your head. Is that playing in a factor in that alphabet soup of thoughts that's going on in your brain right now? Yeah, he's probably like, weighing it out whether he wants to call them up or not he knows he should because he needs the he needs money next month and if they uh, are still interested that would be a good option definitely he's interested in it at all like it's not some conveyor belt work or packing boxes yeah so and it's not a commitment like joining the military which he uh, probably feels like he couldn't do yeah i mean exactly join the military's they're there and i'm not going to try to get on any like social political whatever but there's a reason why it said that the poor fight the wars you know what i mean because a lot of people are forced to join the military because they don't have viable options when they are young or in these situations like this that to them it looks like well there's always this out i'm physically able to you know i don't have a criminal record for people like that it's always like this out that's hanging over your head especially when you've seen examples of people who have done it who have gotten away out of the small town or something like that, who've been able to go see the world for that very example. So this man, Greg, was given an opportunity, finally got pushed into where he saw no other option to do it. So, all right, we are going to cut to Shayton. So, Che, your grandfather just drove off with Brian Eagle, who's passed out in the truck, and you're standing on this porch of your cabin in Standing Rock. What is going on in your head right now when with seeing the fact that like this, all these events that just happened right now just kind of just woke you up in the morning there. Another day in paradise. <laughs> Isn't it, right? <laughs> um, he's, uh, I don't know, he's just a little bit uh, kind of sad for him, you know, for Brian. Is it the sadness because of just realizing, like just the sad state of affairs that he's currently in right now in his life and everything? Or yeah, is it- like he's, he's 
really like he's feeling a lot of things and he's going through a lot and it's just he's just a little bit sad for him you know it's like pity almost like it sucks what he's going through yeah it is and almost the the way that he looks at it like he wasn't good enough to do whatever you guys did now he doesn't have a full understanding this this man only had that brief moment that you all had in the Nipi, and the Nipi again was that Lakota sweat lodge experience that you guys had. And it was like, nothing was ever spoken about that except for right after it happened when you guys are sitting around that campfire and he heard you all trying to articulate something that was almost impossible to articulate what you witnessed together. Cause he had his visions. You all had your shared visions and hearing almost that he saw his sister the same time that you guys saw your sister but this is all stuff that's hard to rationalize in a normal mind you know we're we're trying to articulate an out-of-body experience that's unexplainable that was shared between five people at that moment but he has the understanding that you all saw his sister too but you saw more and more was revealed to you and it's jealousy in a way i would think he's jealous the fact that you and your friends were able to do what he was trying to do i mean i'm sympathetic but at the same time like that's his problem yeah i mean you have your own i mean very much so and i can empathize with che's outlook on that because if that's brian's only concern compared to what che has witnessed and what che's afraid of then brian has a rather easy life you know i'm sure he's got other concerns too i mean he's a person the whole life and everything it's just more that like I got my own shit to worry about and I'm not trying to fix his issues, whatever they may be, but I am sympathetic to the trouble that he's gone through. Yeah. You know, like I'm sympathetic to the, the pain he's felt. So, you know, it's, it's, I get that he's hurting and he's like looking for answers and he's lashing out. I get that. And that's why he was trying to be somewhat helpful is because it's like, guys just going through a tough time. That's all. Yeah. So you know that you look at your watch and you see it's about 930 right now. And you know that usually Monday morning you head to the agency to kind of like talk about what the plan of action for whatever cases you have or new cases that come up or anything. Are your plans after what happened just right now, with Brian, to still like head over there and meet up with the gang? Or do you have anything else you would like to do? No, no, it's it's the same plan as before, you know, okay. just going back over there. It was just now I have something to tell them about. Yeah, now you have a good story to talk about. Like, hey, guess what, guess what I woke up to this morning. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Definitely. So you get in your Jeep and you start to, you start it up and you drive out of the Standing Rock Reservation and you slowly cross into town on the west side of town and you drive over the Missouri River and you get to Main Street where the bar or where the bar that you guys visit is at, but also the Dakota Investigative Services. And you you can hear the sloshing of the sludge of like melted snow that's on the street as you're driving your Jeep. And you can kind of see at this point, businesses along Main Street are starting to open up. You see like there's a tax guy who who has a little business there. You see like there's a little coffee shop where, where like a diner, not really quite a coffee shop, but like a diner, a German diner where people will go and get like coffee in these big, big coffee rolls you know the sweet those big uh cinnamon rolls at usually where older people usually meet you drive past the vfw where you know like veterans hang out and you kind of drive past the civic center on the left and then eventually you get to the side of main street the eastern side that you guys are located on and you see that there's the bakery next door where martha who usually gives free stuff to michael whenever he opens up is there and you see michael's car and you see wayne's car is parked in front and you can see through the glass windows of the opening like there's a big picture glass window that you guys have where it says dakota investigative services it has your hours and it has like a phone number at you see what that there's six desks that are in there three on one side and three on the other and michael has the farthest back left one you can also when you see in there you see the coke machine that's on the right against the wall that you guys end up usually taking free cokes from and drive michael nuts that you guys do that there's a coffee pot that's right next to it. That's like on this little shelf thing that has like a yellow pages and some other stuff. And you see like the creamer stuff or whatever. You can see this all through the window. You see that Wayne and Michael are like kind of talking and you see there's a little excitement when they're talking as you pull up your Jeep along the side of the road. You two, Wayne and Michael, you can see as you guys are talking, you can see the Jeep come pulling up and you see Chayton getting out of the, the driver's side of the Jeep and walking in. Go ahead. Scenes on you guys. So There he is. So you guys look like you're uh, talking about something important. What's going on? 
We got another... Oh, actually, before you tell me about whatever that is, here, I'm going to set down the pictures that uh, I had taken previously. And uh, uh, what was that name of that uh, case? I wrote it down somewhere. I don't have it right now. Yeah, it's a case where basically uh, it was a case of a gentleman. And shit, I don't have the name written in front of me. It's in my notes that are packed away. But it's a case that Chayton was following someone of a man who owns a, a local shoe company like a shoe sales company kind of like a foot locker or pay less more like a pay less kind of store and his wife thought he was having an affair and he was he, he ended up having an affair with like some waitresses who was 10 years his junior and basically chayton got pictures of them like walking into a hotel and you know kind of walking out and the guy's like adjusting his tie you know or them like kissing in a car you know shit like that and he's chayton just like lazies out in front of both you michael and wayne nice good job Jay. really good job that's a good yeah. shot there, Che. You must have gotten pretty close. No, I can be pretty quiet when I need to. So, what's going on? I have news. Yeah, me too. One of it is undoubtedly bad. I'm going to say that out loud. Just all right. And one of it is something. I'll let you decide how to feel about it. Now, the bit of news, well, it's pretty simple. I sort of hand him a donut. You know Terry Murphy, Mr. Big Shot? from the city the reporter who hired us oh yeah 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 he's dead now whoa yeah he kind of like looks around for a seat sits down i was just something that was in the paper uh, the person who actually told me this was jerry hegberg who was here this morning actually so what happened it was a hard attack if you get my meaning He didn't look unhealthy to me, so I just assume it's something to do with, you know what? Uh, I mean, sometimes people just die. This is a little too... Well, I mean, nothing we can really do about it either way. It's just something I think everyone should know, you know, make their own mind up. (sighs) Uh, And sucks. Yes, yes, it... Yeah. And if it is something worse, something connected to things that happened then i want you to i want everybody to be on their guard you know (laughs) for anything weird i know i don't have to tell you that but it's something that i just want to just get out in the open you know don't think i'll ever not be yeah i know i know and the other piece of news the one that's well yeah that is is that The reason Jerry Hegberg came up for us is that he has a job for us. So with that, Jay's just like, not interested? Yeah, well, it's about this missing kid from a school. Uh, The founding member of the school was Callan Wokstetter, which doesn't mean that the kid, something bad happened to him. He already ran uh, away a couple of times, but... A real employer would be the kid's grandfather or, well, he's the one who sort of, he, he said that this time it was different. It wasn't just him acting out. And he believes that he's in danger. Why? I don't know. I didn't have the chance to talk to the old man yet. Well, it's literally happened this morning. So I'm just relaying the info <laughs> I have right now. Okay. Before I'll agree to help with anything involving that, find out more. Because, you know, I don't want anything to do with her for that family (sighs) yeah i mean i understand but it has to be a damn good reason when it comes down to it we're going to be it's going to be for the grandfather anyway vlog stories are just never but if we want to find out more about this stuff or then I don't know. I just feel like Callan Wokstetter wouldn't just start a school just because. Well, I mean, I think the start there would be to figure out why he thinks it's something more than just this kid. Yeah, I agree. I agree. First, we'll go to the grandfather, and then we'll see. Maybe he just doesn't want to deal with his scumbag family. Like I said, we'll see. And just so you know, Jerry gave you the number and name John Donaldson. He's the guy who told him about it, who who works at the school, he said, you'll have to speak to him and he'll connect you with the grandfather, oh, yeah. you know? So, yeah. So first we'll have to speak to John Donaldson who left. The, well, he's the head of security of the school. He's doing this off the records, if you know what I mean. So, yeah. 
You'll see Wayne. He's kind of uh, he's like standing against one of the desks, almost kind of like sitting on it, kind of crouched over. He's just watching the other two, just trying to basically trying to see if Michael can like win Che over on it. He just wants everybody to be on board and, and do this. And he'll just say, come on, guys. This is the type of case we've been waiting for. I kind of agree. Che doesn't really say anything. He's just quiet. Like, he stated what he thinks and is going to wait and see what happens. So he didn't really he didn't really have anything to follow up with that. He's just kind of contemplative. And then so, after a significant pause, you know, he'll say, well, at least let me tell you what happened to me this morning. I put the uh, tray of, of uh, desserts kind of close to him so he can grab one before he starts his story. He uh, <clears throat> says, woke up this morning. I heard something strange. First, I was kind of confused. I didn't know what it was, the sound outside, like, a, like an accident or something. And uh, I went to go check it out. Well, it was a car. Just uh, there was a snow drift that uh, a car had uh, just ran right into. And um, guys, remember Brian Eagle? Yeah, I remember him. Yeah, well, I do as he well. was there and drunk out of his mind. Like, he didn't look good at all. You guys, he he did not look good. He was drunk. He was raving and yelling and just, well, he fell asleep on my porch. And I gave him some coffee and uh, called my grandpa up and had him come pick him up. His, uh, his car is still at my place. Doesn't look too good. Serviceable, but something's wrong with him. He was going on about his, his sister. He was just crying. I don't even know if he's going to remember everything he said. Poor bastard. So... Excuse me if I'm a bit uh, riled up. That's how my morning started. Donut? I'll get some coffee going for you. He just kind of, yeah, why not? Just kind of like takes one finally. I mean, they're made by Martha. You know she makes the best. So, Che, you seen your grandpa today? Yeah. Yeah, he come by this morning and picked him up. How's he doing? Good, I think. You know, uh, you ask him if he needs any help with anything. You know, I'm always around. Well, he's an independent kind of guy. Give him some space. He's always been yeah, uh, right. he's always been like that, you know, just he can do things on his own. He's getting older and refuses to accept it. Doesn't want to admit that sometimes he can't just lift the things he needs. He can. He could have once before. He's a stubborn old guy. That's why I like him. Oh, hello again, folks. I'd like to tell you about the Facebook group we run called White Wolf and Onyx Path RPGs Gameplay and Media. Have you ever wished you could have an easy way to find gameplay videos and podcasts or just media in general that deals with your favorite White Wolf role-playing games? Or have you ever wished you could find a forum to share gameplay that you have recorded? One that won't be drowned out by random posts and discussions so that your media could get the attention you deserve. The group is specifically run with the sole intent of being a one-stop shop for people to view or share media involving the games we all love. We take thorough steps to ensure the page does not become cluttered and is easy to traverse. The group is already immense and continuing to rapidly grow, with new media being shared every day. Stop on by, we hope to see you there.